Leadership Network, our first uh, webinar, and um, we were pretty excited by the responses that we got. Um, lots of people interested in connecting, or at least uh, certainly we're very uh, interested in your feedback after this. Our, our goal and, and, and uh, our hope is to be able to provide um, good professional development for our instructors, help connect you with important topics that are um, on our radar screen. Um, if you have others that you think need to be um, covered or could be covered in future topics, uh, please send them to Sue uh, or to any of us. And uh, we, we are going to start off by just tapping different uh, instructors that we uh, have in our network uh, to present on different topics. Um, but uh, we also might in the future, if this is a hit uh, or is very valuable to people, um, be able to also include uh, outside uh, guest speakers from time to time. So um, we just think it's really important to, to uh, be able to also, in addition to the professional development side, see each other, connect a little bit with each other. And we'll have to figure out how to make this beginning part a little bit more social. Uh, some of us who know each other a little better are much more comfortable just chit chatting and talking. Uh, and we want to be able to include everybody. So if you felt like the first 10 minutes were a little off um, uh, and, and uh, nobody interacted with you, we, we want to improve on that. So um, we'll have to uh, come up with some good ideas for, for using that time as well. But um, our presenters today are um, the only two that are sharing the screen. <laughs> so uh, Carol and Lori, uh, Carol Roth is a, uh, uh, middle school and high school instructional coach at Central York High School, and Lori Brady is her counterpart instructional coach uh, K through uh, six at, at Central York Middle School or C Central York School District. Um, and uh, they've been in that role for I don't know if, uh, Carol at least five years or so for five, and Lori maybe ten ten ish I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's so. And um, they are going to present on on SAMR, and I think I'll, probably most of us are familiar with SAMR, but um, this will help um, give us some more uh, context and, and some more ideas to think about. And also, uh, one of the reasons for this is, is to try and provide uh, ways of connecting these topics to our courses as well, so that we have a way of supporting um, and, and, and providing some answers or some guidance for teachers who are taking our courses. So. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Carol and Lori. Hi, everybody. We're going to uh, try something unattempted by us before, and that is to ask you to multitask this evening. Mm -hmm. So you are connected right now to Zoom, just to share a little, how many, just give us a, a thumbs up if you've used Zoom before. <laughs> All right, we've got a couple of yeses and several noes. Um, just to help you navigate uh, the screen a little bit, uh, the window that you're seeing the video in, if you're seeing Carol and I really large right now, um, you're, you're in speaker view. So you'll see whoever's speaking or whoever's unmuted large uh, and anyone who is not tiled small across the top of your screen. You can also switch to gallery view um, at the top and that will switch you so you'll see all of us tiled on the screen. And when you're moving around in that window, you get a menu bar down at the bottom where you can mute and unmute. So Tony, uh, Nathan, I think, muted everyone. Uh, if at some point you have a question, feel free to unmute at the bottom, ask your question. We won't feel like you interrupted us. Uh, you can also, if you click on the participants button at the bottom of that window, see everyone who's connected. And in that window, if you have a question, you can hit the raise hand button and that will let us know that you have a question. It'll show that uh, your hand is raised. And actually, Nathan, since you started, if you switch um, hosting roles to Carol and I, we'll be able to see those hands that are up. It comes right up across their, um, their video. So I think if you click on us, you can, you can switch us to, to hosting. Thanks. Um, and that lets us see that. Anyone at any time can do screen sharing. That's uh, one thing I, I love about Zoom when we connect uh, with multiple places. Uh, any of the participants can share their screen. So if you have questions, you can use that. And it is a free tool. 
you can record. If you hit the chat window, you'll also see the chat up on the side. Uh, so that's a lot of things going on at one time. We're just going to ask you to kind of stick with us and we're going to try this near pod from a distance, uh, which we weren't sure if we could do or not, but we're, it's looking good. So we have 12 people connected right now and everybody in with their name. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our presentation that we're sharing is twofold. Uh, one is to introduce people to SAMR who may not have heard of it before, and I know that many of you have. Uh, and so we use this presentation also with our teachers in our district to introduce them to SAMR and also to Nearpod as a tool. And so it's something when we're finished, we'll share with you the link uh, that you can take it and use uh, in your own district if that would be helpful. So welcome. We're going to flip our slide here. Hi, Jason. I saw you just joined in. Uh, we have the Nearpod code in the chat window for you if you need it. So what you should be seeing on your screen for Nearpod right now is a question uh, that says, how many times will you find technology in the Pennsylvania core English language arts curriculum and the opportunity for you to put your best guess in there. Yeah, we don't want you to actually research it. No. Just make a guess. All right. Seeing lots of different answers. <laughs> Seeing lots of zeros. All the way up to 20, 20. I think, is our top mm -hmm. answer right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Drum roll. <laughs> and the answer is that there are actually, if you look for the word technology itself, and this we uh, stole from Ann Johnson and uh, Jared Mater at the IU, IU 12. Um, it is only found in that document on two pages. Uh, however, if you search for some of the other pieces that are our technology curriculum, creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, collaborating, uh, you're going to find that there is a lot more technology in there than what we think of as the traditional techie technology uh, pieces that are in the curriculum itself. So our first point that we'd like to talk about is just uh, that technology is not necessarily the technology, the, the nuts and bolts itself. It's what you do with it that counts. And so here you have uh, the ISTE nets for students and the technology and operations is just one piece of so much more. So having students, what you ask students to do with that technology is really what's going to make a difference. And as we look at the SAMR model, uh, that's what's going to uh, raise the bar uh, for getting students involved too uh, and raising the level of technology integration in the classroom. So here you can see the, the SAMR model. Uh, this is uh, done by Ruben Quinta Dora, um, who Laurie had the opportunity to meet up in Maine. Yeah, and uh, so we're going to look at a little video to give you a brief overview of what the SAMR model is and what it's all about, and then we'll talk about that a little bit. So what you have coming up right now on your screen is a video. Um, you're going to go ahead and watch the video, and when you're finished, we want you to come back and raise your hand in the participant window so that you know you're ready. We know you're ready to go on to the next part. Okay? Insert coin.
Hi, Eric. Do you see the directions there for Nearpod? All right, looking good. It looks like people are just finishing up with the video. I'm gonna go ahead and lower hands. All right, so with the whole concept of, of what you're watching in that video, hopefully you've gotten a pretty good overview of, of SAMR in general, but we wanted to be more specific because as we kind of, um, you know, work through whether it's professional development that some of you might do in your own districts or through Eduspire classes, we really feel like SAMR uh, should be kind of woven through everything we do. Uh, if nothing else but to get everybody to think ab about their teaching and think what they're doing, think what the purpose is behind um, all this technology is not just to say woo look at me. I use technology. I'm awesome uh, You know, but really technology with a purpose so you can see um, the in the Nearpod Here are some questions to uh, to be asking as you try to transition from one level to another so you know at the substitution level you know, okay, so I'm replacing something that we could do without technology with technology or maybe a different type of technology. All right, you know, what, what are we gaining through that? But then as we try to go up to the higher levels, uh, moving to augmentation, really looking at what improvements are being made through that change. You know, we don't need to make a change for something that's working great as it is. Hands-on things are important. Face-to-face -face things are important. We all know that. And having balance with all that is critical. But these questions, I think, can kind of guide everybody through, all right, you know, going to this level, you know, what's that critical piece? Um, you know, looking when you, you try to go above the line to the augmentation, <laughs> when we try to uh, move above the, uh, above the line from augmentation into modification and redefinition, we really want to make sure that that task redesign really serves the purpose that we want. 
also when we look at these two, um, what's below the line and what's above the line, uh, I know as we talk to teachers, we really talk about the difference being um, when you step above that line to the top two transformative uh, levels, it's making sure that students are working collaboratively with others, that you're working on things that reach beyond the classroom um, and have really made a change. So uh, as we look at the difference then between below the line and above the line, those are kind of the questions that go through our heads as we try to decide what level is this uh, activity that's happening in the classroom. So, so we're going to take you through um, a little bit of a workflow, he workflow here of what if we were teaching a weather unit in our classroom? We're hoping that weather issues are over for us in school right now. I'm done with snow uh, and uh, days off and delays and things like that. Uh, but we'll look at different apps and how they can be used. And I think one of the biggest things for both Carol and I, as we search for things on SAMR that are uh, online, <laughs> thanks Jim, uh, who are when they post and say, oh, this app is this level or this app is this level, uh, that I don't think, you have to be really careful about those pieces because it's not really the app that's at a certain level on the SAMR model, it's what you do with the app that really counts. Uh, so all of the apps that we'll talk about could be at different levels, it's, it's how we're explaining they're being used uh, that makes a difference. Uh, so if we start uh, on the basic level of substitution, uh, we've got a wonderful app, Pages, that allows you to do word processing, but if all we use it for is to uh, type up a weather journal and substitute it for an electronic journal, for a paper journal, uh, that's all we're doing is, is we're substituting one for another. Um, it might look neater, I might have better handwriting, but it's still just a paper journal. So now you have a job. You're going to choose one descriptive word for what the weather is like right now. Because we didn't arrive at school. No. I hope none of you are at school <laughs> right now. We did debate going to school only because the bandwidth would have been better. All right. And even just, um, you know, as we go through... As we go through these activities, we're not gonna take much time with them. It's just so you get an idea of, of what they're like. And Laurie is sharing out some of the responses. I liked Gusty. Gusty is a good one. Chili, we got a lot of chilies. Yeah. All right, moving on. <laughs> so as we walk up the line to move to augmentation, we can take that basic task of well, what's the weather like right now? And we can, we can ramp it up by going to a location like the Weather Channel online, whether it's on an app or website. And now we have more data that we can work with. So it's a functionality of improvement because it's not just what we see, but it's, it's beyond that. It's, you know, okay, what's, what's the actual pressure? Um, you know, and we can really start analyzing um, what's going on beyond what's visible. So let's unmute for a minute and let people share what are some things that you can do with the Weather Channel app or website uh, that adds functionality that you couldn't do uh, just by checking the weather app. You could research what weather is like in other places of the world on the very same day. Can you practice map skills with it too? Yeah, I like in the, weather, in the app, right? I think Dennis said too about the forecast ability, you know, the ability to look at multiple days and, and what's coming. Um, so it's definitely a tool that adds functionality um, and things that we couldn't do uh, with some other tools by being able to do that. Uh, Jim shared chart predictions, compare how accurate they match up to reality. Great mm -hmm. ideas. Being able to graph those data points. That is a wonderful point, Missy, because that's where we're going to next. 
box. <laughs> Flip in the slide. Uh, so this is just an example. We talked about that forecasting and predicting. Uh, in Nearpod, when you put a question in, you can also add an image to it. So you'll notice right now in the upper uh, corner of your question is a little teeny tiny picture which you couldn't possibly see. But if you tap on that or click it, um, it will pop up larger so that you can see that image uh, and look at what do you think, what trend do you notice? So you can look at trends that are happening in the weather. Yeah, Brenda, we love Nearpod too. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> And then as the as the presenters, for those of you not as familiar with Nearpod, we can see the, the pie graph of the responses and then we can uh, we can see how everybody's doing. We can also share out those results. Mm -hmm. So right now on your screen, you should be seeing uh, a pie graph of the results that were shared uh, by everyone in the group. Uh, and if you pull up from the bottom of your screen, you should also be able to see if, if there was a right or wrong answer, um, it would show you the correct answer and how you, how you answered with that the same question. So we're gonna go ahead and, and step to the, the next level of modification. So now we have been tracking on the weather, learning about weather. Uh, we've been collecting some data uh, from different digital tools. And at the modification level, uh, being able to use those digital tools to simplify a task and really focus on some deeper understanding of that information. Uh, so while none of these tools are necessarily high level in themselves, uh, being able to use them to uh, make the lesson more interactive, to be able to ask students to now look for patterns, to ask questions, to make a hypothesis, to analyze the data that's out there, uh, and be able to use a tool. One of the things that we do in our fifth grade curriculum is <clears throat> we do some investigations, and there's a lot of data collection involved, and time loss, because one of the tasks they have to do is create a line graph for the data that they have so that they can figure out what does the data tell them. Um, that lesson took three days to do because it took a whole day just to collect the data, a whole day to make those line graphs, which was painful in some cases, um, getting them to draw them correctly. And then finally we got to the important part, which was analyzing that data and figuring out what does it tell us and what can we learn from it. Um, and so with a tool like Create a Graph, we were able to put that data in immediately into a Google form, collect the data, put it into graph form, and instantly be able to analyze those results. So we're asking students to do much higher level, um, higher level thinking with the information that's there. So these are just some slides of things that we might ask uh, students to do. So we might be talking about what's January weather like uh, and using some different websites to gather information about the temperature in York and Philadelphia in January from perhaps 2003 to 2013 and then use the data to create a line graph. Um, as we go through the next two slides are just websites uh, that show kind of weather data history um, for York and Philadelphia. So those two websites in Nearpod you can push out, they can be interactive there uh, to gather that information. And then to be able to graph it, you can use a website. We like this Create a Graph website, uh, which I didn't know until just this past week that works really well on the iPads uh, and is simple enough for elementary students or uh, secondary students to be able to use. Yeah, they're actually using it in our high school uh, earth science and chemistry classes. And then uh, you could also, uh, in Nearpod, we put this in here just so you can see, uh, ask students to do graphing right within a presentation. So if we had information to share, we could, you can now go ahead and create your own graph that's in here. To get the graph in the background, that's just an image that we took a screenshot of. So we, we did the, um, the chart itself with the titles and, and the numbers and dates in there to simplify 
uh, how much time it would take. But if you just go ahead and try drawing something on there just so you can play around with the tools a little bit. You just make a smiley face if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> and submit it. We're not going to keep you here very long. Ooh. Nice, Sue. Tammy's got colors. She's doing a bar <laughs> graph instead of a line graph. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, Tammy. Didn't it's mean okay. to call you out. Sue so did a scribble graph, so that's <laughs> all right. <sorry. laughs> so anyway, and again, you know, just Nearpod wise, of course, now we could share out these um, and you wouldn't know. Here's one we're sharing out. So now you can see somebody's work and we have a, can have a discussion about it. And, uh, but you don't know whose it is, so nobody has to be embarrassed. And there's the Create a Graph website. We'll give you all these links um, when we're finished. We have a, a doc that has all the resources that we, we put together here in there. So now we're ready to take it to the redefinition level of the SAMR model. Yeah, and really, you know, this interactivity between different apps and websites and everything are what really makes a lot of this very high level. But now we have this at the redefinition level, we usually uh, look for that social aspect of it, you know, the collaborative piece, preferably outside of the classroom, uh, outside of the building. Um, and in this case, with our, uh, with this particular weather idea, um, you know, we're now getting people to collaborate that are in distances far away from each other that they could be saying, hey, you know, I'm studying your area, you're studying my area, we can compare and contrast. Uh, whether we have all this data, they can interact and talk back and forth about things. So it adds a whole new dimension to, to everything that they're doing through this. And this is some, something that could never have been accomplished, you know, without the use of technology. You know, you'd have pen pals and stuff, and you'd write, and it's weeks later till you get the information back, and by then, you're moving on. So, you know, it really, it, it takes it to such a level that, um, you know, you just could not have managed that before. Okay, and here's where we can do some of the compare and contrast images. So if you take a look at the data that's there, you'll actually see that the York temperatures in January follow a very similar line uh, from the Philadelphia temperatures, but the Philadelphia weather uh, temperatures are slightly warmer at all times every year uh, than York. So this would be where we talk to students about why do you think that's happening um, and ask for some predictions. So if we, we asked you to share those, uh, anybody have some ideas why we would see the weather trend happening year after year? Right, we're seeing uh, proximity to the ocean, maybe closer to the mountains, elevation. Mm -hmm. Good, more inland. We've had, had I was going to say, <laughs> because it's a city of brotherly love, uh, so it's just a little warmer there naturally. Uh, we've had students <laughs> say things like uh, temperature, because it's a city versus not being a city, uh, whether it's closer to the water. And so at this point, we could have groups of students break out with those those ideas of why these temperature trends are happening and have them do research. Uh, so that's where all of those apps came in, share back their results, <laughs> the crying because the Phillies are going uh, to stink this year. Uh, we can have them do those research pieces on topics uh, that are their own ideas and then bring that back to the group, be able to share and discuss within Schoology or at Modo, um, an LMS uh, to share what, what's going on different stages uh, through their research to create a presentation for the class about what they found, were their, were their predictions true, and then being able to pull all of those pieces together 
from our individual groups um, and discuss as a class what can we come to a conclusion about as you're you're going through there being able to compare with other cities at the same longitude latitude. great latitude mm -hmm. that and what's what's happening there Com comparing Pittsburgh to Philadelphia and are you seeing the same thing if you think it's cities you know or comparing uh, Philadelphia to Baltimore if you're looking at the water uh, great and why do you think those those pieces are mm -hmm. This was just a, a video that we popped in here as an example of a student created video um, about weather that could come out of uh, this type of a project uh, as you're working through there. The big piece that we like to talk about encourage teachers but also administrators when when you work with them is that uh, more and more districts are using SAMR as part of that evaluation of technology integration in classrooms. And it's important to not think of it, I think if we go back to that video, not a ladder where you start at the bottom and you climb your way up and then, wow, you're awesome all the time. Uh, but to think of it as that swimming pool yeah. where you know, you're back and forth and, and there are different purposes uh, for the technology that you use in your classroom. Uh, so as you look at the integration that's happening and how it fits in with teacher effectiveness, you know, is that technology appropriate to the task? If I'm doing this activity and it's only a 15 minute activity, I'm not going to be doing transformative technology integration. Uh, I might be using a tool that's going to build later into something bigger that might be at those higher levels, uh, but it should be appropriate to the task that I'm doing. Um, that the technology is scaffolded for students' success. And as uh, administrators come in and out of classrooms, you should see a variety of use over time uh, that we're not constantly substitution, substitution, substitution. And as integrators, uh, and I know many of you uh, right now are in that role, helping teachers to kind of step out of that substitution if, if they know that they're there um, and, and step to a, a higher level of technology integration over time. You're right, Jean, that was Amy in that picture. <laughs> Uh, this website you can kind of browse around and again you'll get a chance to uh, to have these links later but this is a nice website because it really takes those ISTE standards and uh, for teachers and it partners them up with where that's found in the Danielson framework how do they match up so if you have teachers that are like well you know I know I really need to work on certain areas they can look here and see well what ISTE standards support that or the other way around um, and sometimes it's just a matter of having that vocabulary to really recognize that you really are doing some of those things uh, in the Danielson framework in different, uh, different areas, uh, but just maybe not recognizing exactly what you're doing and how that, that fits. Jim asked a question here about um, why is it difficult to find sample lesson plans for above the line lessons? And I, I was going to say probably because it's not just a lesson plan. Most likely, if you're moving to those really higher levels of integration, we're seeing uh, more like project-based learning uh, events happening, things uh, that, that aren't just those simple to explain, here's, here's what I'm doing um, in a simple kind of, of lesson plan. Yeah, definitely, Heather, PBL, you know, most of the times when we get to that redefinition level, it's, it's mostly PBL activities. Um, and Michelle is going to be addressing some of this uh, in her, her next webinar, am I right with there? With the Danielson piece that, mm -hmm. that we have here. Yeah. Okay. on March 29th. All right, flipping the page. <laughs> so here is a collection, and uh, feel free to unmute and, and discuss this, of different pieces that we found out there uh, that give examples to share with teachers of what is what would something look like at each of these levels? And this first one we have in here, because as Carol and I said, when we started, 
we're kind of suspect of some of, uh, <laughs> of the pieces that are posted online that say, hey, this is, uh, this is modification, this is redefinition. Yeah. And if you look at this first example, it's, it's looking at formative assessment. Um, and so they start at that S level with, hey, I'm using Adobe Forms to be able to have students fill out their test on the computer as opposed to um, doing it paper and pencil. Um, and then they stepped it up and said, now it's multiple choice. Where we had a really big problem is saying that's the Socrative app uh, to give live feedback, to get live feedback on a student test was a modification level activity. <clears throat> so let's open it up. How do other people feel about that? I know it's Sunday and we're <laughs> asking you to talk. Yeah, student task is still the same. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that um, the mod uh, modification could just push it a little bit more. I think just because you're using that technology, you know, doesn't make that a modification. I would think that would be more of an example, Laurie, of probably the redefinition still, because it's still a quiz that um, you're getting. The augmentation, right. Right, right. That's My thought, too, is why, why do you, on a test, why, what's the value of getting feedback in a test environment? I mean, if it's, if it's an actual unit test, the, the, uh, you're not going to change or interrupt your teaching to, you know, if it's, if it is formative assessment, then maybe the test is, is a bad choice. But if it isn't a formal test, the, the whole idea of getting feedback in the middle of the test, you're going to get it at the end when you grade it. So. Right. And even if it is, you know, it's the teacher who is getting that feedback on are students getting this or are they not getting that, uh, they might change the direction that they go uh, for their next lesson or the next class. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's really modifying a task that you're asking students to do, that you're modifying what's happening in your classroom and really transforming it. Yeah, Jason, I do agree that would be the teacher is modifying things. So one of the things we really talk to uh, with our uh, with our teachers and administrators is that SAMR is really about what the kids are doing. And sometimes we get caught up in what opportunities am I sharing? What am I doing? How am I presenting this? And it's really what the kids are doing uh, as a result of, of the scenarios you set up for them. We like some of the, the second image that you have there, and, and you have to flip through them yourself, uh, is an infographic. And the next couple then are screenshots because it's really teeny tiny when you put it in there. Um, it looks at SAMR as a framework for education 3.0. Uh, and I love the way that it, it talked about those first two levels as being kind of education 1.0. Uh, this is the way that, that things were done and we might add a slightly different dimension to it. Uh, that when you step above that line, that was like that education 2.0, like web 2.0 now allows for interactivity and content uh, between, between uh, users of things and being able to share and modify what you're doing. And then that, that redefinition is like education 3.0, something completely different than, than what we saw in the classroom or what we were doing in the classroom. And I love the way at the bottom, rather than using specific tools, it talks about different tasks like presentations and videos, and how even though you're, you're creating in a presentation or a video, uh, what that looks like at lower levels versus upper levels of, of, uh, of the SAMR model. So those pieces will be there for you to be able to go back to. This is us learning to multitask on one computer. <laughs> yeah, that's from me for Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, the next piece, loading slowly. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, this is a great little interactive. Uh, so it's a thing link down below if you scroll down on that website, which you can check out later. 
Uh, again, we'll have the links to all these for you, but uh, great interactive. It points out a lot of things throughout the, the PICTO chart uh, down below to help you interact with that and get some ideas of what that might look like at different levels. And I know with the um, iPad 2 class that that's coming, one of the things to, to talk about that next level mm -hmm. of integration with iPads is the, the whole idea of app smashing. Um, so being able to take things from one place and combine them uh, and, and, and that workflow of, of putting them together. Here we've got two different tools, um, you know, so creating an infographic to share information and then using ThinLink to make it interactive and get you out to those different uh, resources. Uh, thanks, Brenda. We mm. like ThingLink too. All right, so what questions do you have about SAMR right now? Do you have things that you think, all right, well, you know, how do I present this in my class? Is there any clarification you need on any of the areas or ideas that you're wondering about? This is the appropriate wait time. We should throw them in the chat. Or... So Eric shared too, how, do, how much do we cover in iPad 1 so we don't step on the toes of the iPad 2 course? Um, Jim, would you want to share a little? About yeah um the only thing that we do is to um I, think I do anyway i ask what they know of it and um i mentioned that it's in that the ctc course we'll also talk about it in the ipad 2 course but really we just bring it up and and my bottom line is uh what you said earlier this is just um but common, easy to understand vocabulary to help you reflect on what you're doing. And so when I think of it, uh, when we do a, a talk about a lesson example with a particular app, I'll ask where would that fall on a SAMR model, but typically uh, I don't think of it. And also to ask, you know, where, how could this app be used at different levels in the SAMR? SAMR model. The language of the SAMR model is, is kind of nice and clean and, and simple, uh, but then determining where things go sometimes is, is a gray area. Another question that came in was, given how math is tested, how do you see those lessons uh, moving above the line? And I know that we have a high school teacher that, that Ben had this year, one of the things that she asked students to do are problem presentations. So they create screencasts to explain problems um, and they, they choose different problems throughout the semester. She has quite a collection. Um, so getting them to kind of create and really explain their thinking and being able to use those to help other students um, as they're working on homework, preparing for tests and things like that. Yeah, they also use that Viveboard quite a bit. Our math teachers love Viveboard. So this collaborative whiteboard that is so easy for, uh, for collaborators to jump on and uh, they, they definitely, they use that a lot. And a lot of times it's for things that they, uh, they do share out and, um, and different, um, different classes use as review guides and things as well. Brenda shared in the chat there um, some reflective questions for evaluating designs of classroom tasks. And I really love that. Brenda, would you like to talk about that for a second? <laughs> Was that a no thank you? <laughs> That's all right. 
Yeah, it's not about the app, but the task. Oh, there you go. I love that blog. Yeah, she put a link to the link. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just posted a languages blog, which you're probably familiar with, um, Sylvia Tolisano. Um, her stuff is great. And on this link, you can actually submit a lesson and have it evaluated for SAMR. Um, and th that's a fun one that we've shared. And, and then because er everybody's into it and then they, they're like, oh, no, we don't want to be <laughs> evaluated. So it's kind of funny, you know, um, to see that. But yeah, those reflective questions are just um, something I actually posted them. I forget where I may have gotten them from Sylvia. I'm not sure or from Quentin Dora, but we have them posted on a, a SAMR page on our teacher resources um, just to give teachers something to reflect about because it's very easy, you know, like we saw in that chart that you posted, it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking about how it changed your job as the teacher, but it has to be about how it changed the learning. So that, that's all I wanted to submit, you know, just to share those questions. And again, I don't think I wrote them originally. I adapted them from somewhere, <laughs> but it might have been Sylvia. So I, I love that, uh, that blog too. So we've seen that one. One question, Brenda, I would have for you is, have you seen the link to the actual activities that were submitted where you can see the lessons that people, people um, turn for that? I've, have, have you seen them? I haven't. So I was curious if you had. You know what? I don't. I'm looking at the site right now, again, where she has, you know, where you fill out the Google form. Mm -hmm. But I don't see a link to see what she has. Right. So maybe I could send Sylvia a note because um, I actually interviewed her for a project last summer. So I, I feel comfortable doing that. And um, maybe I'll just send her a note and say, hey, what have you gotten so far? Because <laughs> we're all very curious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> right. Thanks. Sure. Um, Eric, I see that you asked if you could use this uh, Nearpod to explain SAMR to your iPad classes. Definitely in the, uh, the link that I sent up a little bit, and I can post that on again then before we're finished, it takes you to a Google Doc that has all of our resources. And the first resource that's on there is a link to the Nearpod so that you can copy it for yourself and you can modify it. Um, so that you can use it in your classes or whatever, take out whatever you don't want, uh, add other things in if you want to add your own flavor to it. Kevin also shared, his question was, you know, the really hard part is getting to that last step um, and ideas for helping teachers get there. And I, I think collaboration is a big mm -hmm. part of that because um, taking that leap to do something really transformative, project-based learning is sometimes scary, um, or teachers aren't sure like where to start. So being able to uh, have somebody to collaborate with, um, I know our middle school is there, they're Tammy. working through, um, <laughs> Tammy could talk a little bit about their PBL process um, that they've gone through this year and really trying to make that uh, part of the climate in the, in the building. Tammy, can we put you on the spot? <laughs> Don't forget to unmute yourself. There you go. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, what would you like me to share about PBL? Just a little blurb about what you guys are doing at the middle school, how you kind of set that up. So um, during the second, third, and fourth marking period, we become an extension of the main content area classes. Uh, during the second marking period, we um, have partnered up with history, and we uh, create a lesson with the history teachers. We have a PBL collaboration day the previous marking period, and we come up with a uh, project-based learning task that has history as its goal. Um, then when the students come to our class every single day during the second marking period, it's really like them coming into an extra 40 minutes of history class. Um, and then the third marking period, we have a science and math PBL. And um, now this marking period, we have just met with the language arts teachers so that we can implement 
the um, PBL for language arts during the fourth marking period. So trying to uh, just get everyone um, to understand um, the, the purpose of PBL and, and is to really engage learners and to help use technology in that transformative way. Yeah, and just kind of watching the process, what I've seen is that it, it pulls some teachers into something that they wouldn't have done on their own because it's it's scary. You know, it's a huge change in your classroom. There are a lot of unknowns. And because as a department, they're working on it and they're working collaboratively with the skills for digital age learner teachers like Tammy, um, they're not in it all alone, you know. So, you know, it's completely what Laurie said that because they're collaborating on it, it just makes it a little bit easier to to jump into that. Uh, yeah, it definitely is tricky and, you know, you kind of just grit your teeth and jump in. Nathan asked, is it possible to get to re redefinition without going global? And I think it is. Um, I think the key is getting outside of your classroom, whether that authentic and having that authentic audience and other people to connect with. Um, so that could be someone in your community. Uh, it could be another school, um, but it, it doesn't necessarily need to be global in the sense of I'm connecting with another country um, to be to be redefinition. We are getting close to that hour mark, so I don't want to keep people longer. Sue and Nathan uh, will we'll be glad to answer questions, but we don't want to hold people up either. Sunday night, thank you for giving up your time, uh, for being patient with us. And you can always email us if you have any questions, um, and feel free to use all of those resources for whatever you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, we might send you an email just to collect any ideas you might have on, on um, you know, how, how you felt this was in terms of your use of time and, and other topics you might think of or other ways of, of making uh, this a valuable time. Um, but we, we, we would love to be able to connect over the next, uh, we have, what, two or three more be scheduled, uh, three more. So um, uh, Michelle is here. Uh, and or she was here. Uh, at least I'm looking for more of my windows. There she is. <laughs> I had to pull down my windows to see. And then uh, Brenda is uh, also here. She's doing one. And we have a third topic. Who's doing that one? Um, Mariah is oh, doing okay. the last one. Yeah, yeah. This is on good design. Yeah. So she's not on here. But um, yeah. So um, we want to thank you for for being part of this and. Um, I think it's going to be great to to just help us connect on this topic, um, on the topics that we're talking about. And just briefly, the the one that came up, you know, how much do we cover this in iPad One, or, you know, how much do we cover? Those are interesting questions uh, as well that can be worked out amongst those instructors. And and also uh, probably just a reminder too for, you know, Jim talked about um, I, I do this, but then sometimes I I I don't talk about it as much. And bringing it up helps to reinforce, hey, this might not be a bad use of time. Um, as, as I go through your own course, uh, there, there, there are different things that you can touch on and, and have more of a context for. So, okay, uh, Tony, anything you want to mention? Are you? Did you leave? Yeah, no, this was great. Now I'm here. Um, no, thank you, Carol and Laura. This was excellent. Mm -hmm. um, for those um, who have ideas for other webinar topics, maybe something that you and Nathan alluded to this earlier, but maybe things that that uh, you would like to present on. Um, Please contact Sue and, and let her know what you're. Well, if you know somebody, if you know somebody, yeah, you know somebody network, else. And you go, this person would be great, and I know them, <laughs> and yeah. I can invite them. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, and uh, this 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 is a great format, um, and we'd also like to extend some of these webinar topics more broadly to our to our uh, course participants. So you know, we're we're, we're kind of launching our webinars through the Edgespire Leadership Network here, but um, you know, the, the same topics are relevant for the broader um, uh, set of people as well. So, so uh, yeah, if you have ideas, please, please share them with Sue. I, I think I mentioned one of my emails is, you know, we, we're, we're paying people to do these webinars. So, so we, we want you to, to certainly feel like, uh, you know, it's worth your time. And uh, so please, uh, please contact Sue if you're interested. Thank you, Carol and Lori, for preparing that and making it as interactive as you did with the Nearpod. That was great. I think everybody appreciated that. And applause, yeah. <laughs> and um, 
giving it being being our first uh, run. I think it was it was great. So you guys should feel good about that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Everyone, have a good evening. Bye. See ya. Bye. Nathan, will you be posting? Will you be getting a, a link for where this is going to be yeah. posted then? Or? Yes, I will try and I will try and find that. I just stopped recording my uh, local copy, so okay. you, can, you can probably edit out to our uh, section of everybody watch the video by yourself, and then we're like, do 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 do. That'll be all right.